Welcome, everybody. My name is Mona Merkinaite. I'm with the Rethinking Europe program at Open Lithuania Foundation. And in the framework of this um, program, we are implementing a project focused on the memory of 1989, specifically on the challenges to democ democracies through the lens of transition. Um, <clears throat> what came up consistently during the project is the self-limiting and, uh, and anti-ideological nature of resistance movement. The history of 1989 suggests that meaningful political actions may lie beyond the ide ideological worldviews and divides. So when we recall the 1989 as a fight for liberal democracy or against socialism, reduce its diverse meaning to a single idea. People acted together to constitute a free space apart from the dictates of the regimes. And so since the collapse of Soviet Union, at least here in Europe, uh, we have witnessed something similar in Ukraine during the Euromaidan and now during the protests in Belarus. <clears throat> Those suggest that real political change and unified force of civil actions come from outside the ideological associations. Of course, the fall of bipolar world had global implications as well. Add to that the changing dynamics of ideology and democracy because of the new wave of populism. Questions like what is populism's relationship to political ideologies and ideas? How? the populism changes the nature and the ways of political represent representation and be are becoming central. <clears throat> and so, uh, as well as a question of how populists use the vacuum of ideas following the collapse of Soviet Union are uh, becoming central. Not to mention the technological progress has weakened the traditional party politics as social movements organize horizontally and learn from each other more. So in the preparation for this discussion, we discussed with our distinguished guests, whom I will introduce shortly, how to best approach the question of dynamics between ideologies and democracies. And we came up with the idea of having a dialogue rather than presentations and have an event where we inquire things rather than provide our own answers. So let me introduce uh, our distinguished guests of the dialogue today. We have Jeffrey Goldfarb, who is a professor, uh, professor of sociology at the New School for Social Research. He's the co-founder of the public seminar and also runs democracy seminar, which is a worldwide com uh, committee of scholars journalists, activists, and citizens who uh, seek to understand the origins of the threats to democracy and offers a platform for exchange of the ideas. He is a longtime supporter of the academics in exile at the new school, including the ones who were persecuted by the Soviet system in the 70s and 80s. And his thinking is very much informed uh, by the history of the region. As we were preparing, Jeff uh, mentioned that he will focus most on his experience and his relationship to the region, as well as on the US politics. Our second participant is Nadia Urbinati, who is a professor of mod modern and contemporary politic political thought. She teaches at Columbia University and is also a visiting professor in Italy, France, and Brazil. She is one of the permanent scholars researching and writing on issues of democracy, the democratic and anti-democratic traditions. In 2008, Italy's president awarded uh, Urbinati the commandment of Italian Republic for her, uh, for her contribution to the study of democracy and diffusion of Italian liberal and democratic thought abroad. She's the author of many award-winning books like Mill and Democracy and her la latest one, um, Me, the People, How Populism Transforms Democracy is read by both political scholars and philosophers, which is a testament to the richness of the writing. 
So as I mentioned, we will conduct this event in a form of dialogue between uh, the two distinguished guests. Um, we will head off with some pre-prepared questions we felt were important to address. And in about 40 minutes time, we will also um, introduce the audience into discussion. So please think of your questions and pose them in the chat window that you see on the right corner. Um, we will try to get to as many of them and answer all of them. So uh, let me start with a little bit of history. Um, some consider the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, as an origin of the post-truth politics and a new uh, populism that has quite an arbitrary relationships to the ideological frameworks. So first I want to ask for your um, more personal perspective, your memories, what you thought 1989 will bring and how that thinking has changed in 30 years. And the second part of the question is exactly that. Do you think that the problems faced by democracies today can be at least in part attributed to the collapse of the ideological divide in the pre-1989 world? So Jeff, maybe let's start with you. Well, thank you, Simona, for um, uh, your generous uh, introduction and for inviting me to this uh, intriguing dialogue uh, with my uh, colleague, Nadia Urbanati, uh, who I should add, I met uh, uh, directly as uh, we took part uh, together in the democracy seminar and particularly uh, as we uh, ex uh, uh, discussed her most recent book, uh, which fascinating book. So uh, 1989, uh, I think about those times um, with uh, very fond memories and, um, and it strikes me that um, a term Hannah Arendt uh, uh, used to describe a similar phenomenon uh, uh, is appropriate. I think that it was a moment of what she called the lost treasure of the revolutionary tradition. I think it was a time of fundamental transformation where people could speak, 1989 and the years leading up to 1989, where people could speak with each other on the basis of some fundamental shared principles uh, uh, committed to what they called a normal society. So we could infer from that a normal liberal democracy, uh, um, but uh, th they thought anew about it. And uh, uh, I, I remember 1989 as being, my, my hopes of 1989 were that the, the kind of uh, deadly ideologies of the 20th century uh, had come to an end, uh, both of the left and the right, of uh, the ideologies connected, connected to Soviet Marxism and uh, to Nazism and uh, fascism. And I had this sense, uh, I had this belief, and now as, as I'm thinking about it now, I'm, I, I'm not sure if it was a hope or if it was an appraisal. <laughs> so uh, it seems now that it was, uh, if it was an appraisal, I was wrong. And I think when we talked earlier in preparation for our discussion, I said, this is my biggest mistake because I thought this kind of magical, totalizing uh, uh, political uh, uh, thought, political system that the world had learned that uh, not to pursue that avenue. So Fukuyama uh, said it was the end of history. I, I, I found that bewildering. And actually most of the people I knew uh, 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 thought that this idea that somehow this unfolding of the ideal political system uh, um, um, had reached its culmination uh, it, with the defeat of, Soviet, of the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, um, um, didn't very ma make very much sense. But the idea that ideology of a certain sort had come to an end, uh, that that was my hope of the time, and I and I think that it's still my hope. 
So, you know, I refer to Hannah Arendt because I think that there, there was a fundamentally sharp idea, which includes making a, a strong dis distinction between political ideas and political projects on the one hand that are uh, and political ideas uh, uh, that are self-limiting, that are modest, that are open to alternatives on the one hand and political ideas that were uh, um, uh, uh, seen as, as political truths and that, that the object was actually to enact these political truths through the uh, use of, uh, of state power. And uh, uh, I thought that we could draw those distinctions, have an open discussion, uh, you know, reject the, the latter type of thought, which is the term I would like to use. I would like to use the term ideology to refer to that. And we could still have contests, political contests between political, competing political ideas uh, with, that are presented in a public sphere uh, um, for discussion. And uh, I think that one of the very big problems of the um, of the immediate aftermath of 1989 is that some questions were seen as being answered too easily by uh, uh, economic policy shock therapy by uh, in notions in fact of transition that we were going to go from one political system a bad political system and all we had to do is follow uh, a recipe to get to a more ideal political system System. So I, I actually was always um, um, kind of uncomfortable with, with the idea of uh, political transition and transitionology as if there was a clear endpoint, because it seems to me that uh, what I learned in being connected to the opposition in, in Poland and in Central Europe was that uh, 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 an openness to alternative views, an old, old openness to alternative paths of development characterized the moment. And then it was lost when people too quickly chose uh, um, uh, a formula of liberal capitalist democracy, uh, as, if that, as if that's uh, a, an alternative system that, that was the key to happiness. So my, at the moment of 1989, I was very enthusiastic. And then very soon after, I felt that the, the key insight of the round tables, the key insight of Solidarność, the key insight of the democratic opposition throughout the old, all around the old so Soviet bloc was lost very, very quickly. Well, I can uh, perhaps continue on this uh, line a little bit because I find this extremely uh, interesting to uh, understand uh, the illusion and the disillusionment connected with the uh, 1989. Uh, so there was certainly the decline of a despotic form of socialism, the decline of the mythology of a popular democracy as if, uh, or socialist democracy, as if it were, it could exist without basic liberal um, rights. It was the end of the myth of a trajectory of history with an end incorporated within. It was an end of a the theology of, uh, uh, of revolution and messianic uh, waiting for uh, the city to come, the, the, um, the utopia to come. So it was a good end in some sense. It was the end of some important stones or limitations uh, of, critical, of critical knowledge for many of us. And, then, and in some sense, uh, along with this decline, however, uh, something important uh, didn't decline. And it is uh, relevant for us and perhaps, uh, yes, I, I will come back. Uh, 
some important things didn't decline with the decline of Soviet form of socialism, of state socialism with despotic and at time also totalitarian characteristics. Some important elements of uh, the tradition uh, of socialist tradition in particular, not only Marxist, but also the socialist tradition uh, needs to be considered. And those here in those days, as Jeff just said, uh, many people tended to, um, to, close the, to close the book uh, too easily and to close the book with good things uh, inside also, not only the, uh, the despicable ones. First of all, uh, we learn that uh, certainly the socialist revolution cannot be a, a resolution of all our problems, perhaps is the beginning of problems if one wants to say so, historically speaking. So we are not waiting for that moment. But Marx, Marx sociology, um, understood as a critical sociology, as a critical approach to understanding the world in which we are. Well, that uh, sociology of Marx uh, um, raised problems that are still with us today, first of all, and we cannot avoid thinking critically with Marx about these problems. First of all, the primacy of economic power over political and cultural power. Second, the tendency of capitalism to produce a, an oppression through labor so that the entrepreneurial activity that can be also, must be also a condition for creation um, and fulfillment of the self ends up uh, uh, more than, uh, yes, uh, more than no, a situation of oppression. And this is still here with us. Third, the conception of the states or the political institutions as an instrument in the ends of the defense of interests, of some interests, economic interests. And those issues are still here relevant. They help us, and uh, they help us to understand many things in the transformation of democracy after after 1981, we cannot disclaim that those issues are still with us. The, the other third thing is um, 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 re reflection I would like to put on the floor and then we can start talking perhaps, is that uh, uh, democracy not only is not an end, uh, doesn't have an end, but democracy is the beginning of something. And we don't know yet the outcome of that beginning. So that 1989 18, 18, helped us in the, in, the um, in, due, in due time, not immediately. It took a while, perhaps, to see that democracy is not something to be reached. It's not like a, a land to be uh, to land, and this is done, and this is the end of everything. It is actually the beginning of all the problems. Uh, to be uh, discussed freely and um, with the open possibility, unfortunately, also for unpleasant, unpleasant outcome. So in my view, after the 89, something happened, perhaps not immediately, but in the, in the, in the course of the time, we started, at least this for me, seeing democracy as something that needs to be stopped to be mythologized. It is a way in which human societies put uh, themselves into the risky job of creating their own answers to the problems they produce. And this is risky. So, and sometimes it gives, you, it gives us something we don't like. Yeah. We don't like Trump. This was given to us by democracy though. So yeah. I'm stop here now. Yeah, so, so, so I have a, a number of responses to that. First, having to do with uh, um, um, uh, you know your last point that that uh, and 1989. For me, 1989 is not the formula to move forward, but it's actually the culmination of a democratic process uh, of people engaging democratically, not knowing what the end would be. Yeah but actually wanted, wanting to take control of their lives. 
And I think that uh, uh, people of various political orientations achieve this. Uh, um, there were liberals, there were conservatives, there were radicals, leftists, Marxists. Uh, and uh, none of these traditions, uh, uh, it would have been best if all these tr traditions were still alive and interacting with each other and um, uh, in a less than perfect way, because there, with, with a full awareness that there is no perfect way, constitute an alternative political life, an alternative social life. And uh, I agree with you that uh, um, uh, elements of the Marxist tradition and uh, even more so elements of the socialist tradition uh, were needed at this moment. It, it, it was an important critical component of the political mix. Um, and uh, too rapid dismissal of that uh, led to very unfortunate consequences. Uh, maybe the, the, uh, uh, the easiest way to encapsulate uh, the problem of ignoring that tradition is this idea of shock therapy, that somehow, they're, they're, you know, immediately a free market, a radical, uh, you know, we, we, before the discussion, I, I, I was telling you, Nadia, that I don't like the term neoliberal, but a Marxist, and I prefer Marxist fundamentalist. So a Marxist fundamentalist steering mechanism was brought, brought into play. And, and I think that that led to uh, a great deal of suffering. At the time, I thought that society and politics are, are messy. And I thought that uh, if democracy was constituted, there would be resistances to that shock therapy. And um, uh, th there would be, um, um, uh, there would not, uh, tragedy would be avoided. Uh, I think, you know, to summarize uh, very, very uh, uh, compactly and perhaps too compactly, uh, I think that what happened is that uh, free market, you know, radical free market position was instituted. It, it did produce the kinds of injustices and inequal or, or radicalize the kinds of injustices and uh, uh, inequalities uh, that could be expected and laid the groundwork for the populist moment. Uh, uh, and then not only uh, to, to the degree to which what was happening in Central Europe was echoed globally, uh, um, uh, not only in th that part of the world, but uh, um, transnationally. Um, uh, I, the only, this, I, so far we're agreeing with each other. The only disagreement I have is this idea, this Marxist idea of the primacy of the economic, if, if I understood you correctly. I think uh, it's a problem. Yeah. For me, it's a problem, but he oh. made us, he made us. Think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, 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 so I think that the economic is very important, but uh, 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 the moral, the social, the cultural exactly. uh, uh, are, are uh, uh, very, very much uh, interconnected, and and uh, sometimes uh, a simple idea can over alternative idea can over uh, overpower uh, material conditions. No, no, but, but I think yeah, you're yeah, right. I think yeah, I, was, yeah. I was reading mass in this way, making right. us see how, how reductivist is to consider all human life connected to the question of interest and economic survival. Right, right. So, 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 so then there's the kind of irony that the, uh, uh, the most radical anti-socialist, the most uh, uh, anti-Marxist actually mimicked the the yes. uh the marxist position yes and they thought you know if we take care of the market then all problems exactly would, you know, everything else would sol solve itself so we we don't dis disagree we no we, no we would say yeah, actually yeah. that liberalism in this radical way you mentioned it is a kind of uh, a reconfirmation of the some unity between marxism and liberalism on this primacy of the economic right both of right, them right right right, right. Yeah. And so we, 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 can, we can read that in a critical way instead of embracing it, of course. I mean, uh, in, both in the liberal and the Marxist sense, yes.
Right. And, and, and then I would add that, uh, 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 you know, I, I think one of the prime, uh, major problems that exists now in the United States, and not only in the United States, but, uh, um, you know, strikingly in the United States, is that we've lost uh, a sound conservative political position. So, so, so that uh, um, there, there are, we inherit insights uh, 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 we, uh, from the past, uh, ways of knowing and, uh, 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 that, uh, are being destroyed, uh, have been destroyed, uh, throughout the 20th century and, um, and, uh, at the present moment, and that an important part of, um, of, politics is not only that the socialist tradition should be kept alive, I agree, uh, uh, but also the conservative tradition mm -hmm. should be kept alive. And that I described before we uh, went uh, live, I described myself as a radical centrist. And this is exactly what I mean, that, that there should be a center to politics where people of alternative political views actually meet each other and uh, are, in, uh, are able to in, engage, uh, speak and act in interaction with each other, and then develop a capac capacity to act in concert. That's people on the left, right, and center. And um, uh, that has, I thought that that was going to be a fruit of 1989, and alas, it wasn't. And things have gotten much, much worse in my native land now uh, because uh, um, uh, that's not the case. So I think part of the very severe crisis in the United States is, uh, you know, I'm heartened by recent developments that the left and, and uh, kind of the insights of social democracy and the, um, the critique of racism and sexism uh, uh, and, and so forth are now a serious part of our political life. But the conservative response to that, the, the kind of... Uh, reasonable conservative response to that is missing. And in its place, we have fanaticism that uh, I fear. I, I'm relatively optimistic about the immediate present, immediate future in the United States, but profoundly uh, pessimistic about the long-term future of the United States, exactly because the conservative response to things that I want are becoming absolutely bizarre and dangerous. So my question is then, uh, you've raised both uh, the point of um, inherited uh, ways of knowing and thinking that is usually is redu reduced to ideological thinking and uh, re the reductionist nature of any ideology. I mean, it, it prefers the, the consistency of the idea uh, over individual facts, judgments and accountability. So. Um, and the populist movements, it seems, take a great advantage of the ideological device in, so in societies and make it harder to reconcile those differences between groups. Um, yet, um, uh, ideas are key for the life of democracy, yeah. and you write an idea about this in your, in your last book. Um, it is vital to the process of representation that has been eroded by uh, the populist movements. So the question is then, uh, do we still need ideolo ideologies in democracy today? And what is their role? So Simone, thank you, because this allows me to continue the conversation. Because when uh, Jeff said that uh, there is the erosion of conservative and the radicalization of the right, or the conservative is simply, this is a problem we also face, although perhaps less dramatically, but in some countries like mine, as much as dramatic as in the States, not as much as dramatic as in the United States. It's the same logic. Until the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, the critical, um, the criticism against the so-called um, liberal democracy came from the left. Now, the left doesn't have any critical arguments to make so strongly, <laughs> but it's the right wing that has strong arguments against the democratic, uh, liberal democratic system. They call it uh, 
they call it the establishment uh, against uh, the interest of the many or the interest of the people or the interest of the nation. So they transform uh, the actor, the agent from class into identity kind of, could be a nation, could be an activist kind of interpretation of the nation. And this makes uh, the erosion of moderation in the opposition that could be a real a problem for democracy. Because every time democracy in the past at least had to face the radical criticism of the right wing, it was a disaster, at least in Europe. Yeah. In, uh, in the case of the, United, the uh, Soviet Union, it developed from within a non-democratic, not yet a democratic society, but in Europe, Western Europe, the criticism from the right, from the from the right against democracy, was unfortunately victorious in 1921 and 33. So we have to be very, very, very concerned about the loss of moderation in the language and the ideology of the right wing, and this is uh, what also opens us to populism. So doesn't mean that we have to throw away all ideologies in the name of a kind of centrist mentality. It doesn't make any sense. Ideologies are not simply a, a conglomeration of relig religious kind of beliefs. There are also strategies for reading reality, uh, critical, uh, critically reading reality, and also for proposing solutions. So we need scheme of mental disposition to reality that are based on principles or assumptions, uh, we cannot avoid them. And this is part of what politics is about. Now, the question is, how can we deal with the, the ideologies that become so impermeable to critical and deliberative and discursive interactions that they refuse, they refuse any encounter with the others? This is what brings us today to a populist, uh, you know, this uh, fake kind of news approach, uh, uh, assumption that there is an enemy always there and we have to protect us against uh, that, refusing any forms of uh, self-critical approach to reality. This, for me, is today the most relevant problem that democracies are facing. We call, we call it populist because we don't have another name, perhaps. But yeah. it's... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, no, 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 don't, don't be sorry. But I, you know, I, I, I first, I, I'd like to confess something. That is, um, soon after 1989, uh, many of my friends uh, in Central Europe and Latin America started wondering, worrying about the direction democracy was going, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and uh, when it was going in ways that they didn't particularly like, they called it populist. Exactly, uh, and I and I always say, well, I, I I then puzzled, like, what's populist and what's democratic? Yeah, and it seemed that populist was um, things that ordinary people wanted that my friends uh, wanted to ignore, and and, and I think that uh, it was democratic bad faith on their part to yeah. uh, could not listen to the criticisms that were coming out of ordinary people. Absolutely. So, so, uh, um, so then I didn't want, you know, I told you I don't like the, to use the term neoliberalism. Then I would, was going around saying I don't like to use the term populism. Uh, now I like to use the term populism, I'll say as a student of Nadia, be, because I think that she's getting to something very, very important about the present moment, which we're discussing now. <laughs> That 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 uh, th th there's uh, yeah so th maybe that's it for, for for the moment. Can we continue on populism, yeah. or you want to give us another hint? Yes, I just wanted to, to ask an, another question, uh, yeah. Anaya. When you talked about the self uh, critical lack of the self critical approach to reality. And then you know the which explains at least in part of the wave of populism. So. Why do you think, why do you, and maybe you, Jeff, as well, uh, on behalf of, uh, from U.S., why does that happen? Hmm. Well, this is, this would require a conference and even more of, of its own. So let's try to see 
uh, things from um, what the populists today are critical of. So first, just within parentheses, let's try to avoid using populism as a way of attacking what we don't like. Yes. Don't use populism as a polemical strategy. No, because sometimes after particularly Brexit, every uh, po many politicians and also academics, I have to say, they accuse of populism everything that is oppositional to an existing government. This is, is, is wrong because otherwise there is no longer place for opposition. So we cannot say that democracy is simply inside of the institutions and democracy is no longer outside. Of, no, it's also outside and sometimes develops critical approach. So having said so, populism, we use populism knowing about this uh, risk and we try to use it as a, as a cognitive category, helping us to understand what is the kind of democracy we are, we are facing now. First, think in this way, think in historical way. Democracy is an historical, not only makes history, but it also has some historical differences inside of its long history. In the last 200 years, had different forms of manifestations. Now, populism is one of these forms of manifestation when a populist movement or leader or majority has power and acquires power through election. So we need to make an effort to try to understand what kind of democracy is this one and why we are right to be concerned. So it is a form of democracy that my view, at least, analyze the United States under Trump, analyze my country, Italy, analyze uh, Hungary and other countries around. It is an attempt to fill the gap between institutions and politics, between institutions and those who use the institutions, between the institutions and uh, the majority winning uh, the game. And the attempt to declare that this is the only way we have to make the interest of the people first, as if the interest of the people are collapsed with the, the occupation of the institutions for the, those interests. So there is an attempt of possessing institutions and declaring thus that only one majority is the good one, that there is no so, uh, such a thing as majority rule. There is the rule of the good majority. And the other majorities before are not truly majority. They are fake kind of majority orchestrated by an establishment. We learn about that by listening, by listening to Trump. Now, why this came now? Why now and not in the 80s? Do you remember? It's very interesting to analyze historically uh, the issue because the first huge conference, International Conference on Populism, 1967, London, with the Hofstetter and, uh, and Berlin. In that conference, Europe and the, and the Soviet Union, we were already inside of the, of the Cold War, they were simply the past, no, 19th century. The present was those countries in so-called third world that were eman emancipating themselves from colonization and they were defined as populist. There is another important conference, then a book, 2002, a book. The conference was at the end of the 90s in the European University Institute with um, Yves Beni, <coughs> producing another book. In that book, practically, there is only Europe and the United States, and more than that is Europe. So populism came back from to the so-called third world back to the center, to the first war, so-called, why? First, the accusation was the transformation of politics is in an issue of uh, cognitive, epistemic, impartial doing by procedures and institutions. So there was no room for politics as uh, mobilization of the people, criticism, and so on and so forth. So one way of... The other criticism was the expansion of the domains in which decisions are made without being based on uh, electoral 
uh, consent or electoral uh, legitimacy. There's many, many uh, domains in which decisions are made by experts, by techno technocrats. So the narrowing space of the politics in parliaments or in the law making places, even in those law making places, sometimes the laws are written by, by committees of experts we don't know even the name of. So that was an accusation of transformation of democracy into a um, juridified epistemic fact. So is this criticism completely wrong? How can we how can we have citizens being, as Jeff said before, self-constructing their own society, uh, creating their own, if uh, they, uh, if politics is supposed to be an issue of problem solving, technically speaking, without any, uh, I wouldn't say emotional, but certainly a moment of passionate element, uh, 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 input, like, uh, the basic principle of freedom, the basic principle of equal uh, political uh, power the citizens should have, uh, the condition for uh, the condition for a democracy. These are important issues that are political; they are not technical. So, 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 so I oh, excuse me. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. No, so, so, it so, seems so. that one. It seems to me, just a few, that one of the condition why the populist uh, the populist rhetoric is so. Uh, attracting to people, it is because they give them back politics uh, against the, the other so-called uh, politicians, comprising also of the center-left, who have embraced a, a kind of, uh, not centrist, but certainly uh, a politics that has to do with problem solving, full stop. Right. So, so, so I, you know, I, I think that, um... Um, you know, as a sociologist, not a political theorist, uh, I, I'm uh, um, my focus has mostly been on social interaction, human interaction, and um, the story you just told. Um, uh, I would actually highlight one of the human senses, a deficiency of one of the human senses, that we don't listen to each other. Uh, th th that. You know, I, I think it's a, uh, our, our ability to hear and listen to, to others is the key sense of democratic life. Yeah. And, and, and that uh, one of the problems, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the populist program of Trump and Trumpism is reprehensible and the people who hold that position are responsible for the position and uh, they're, they're between being my opponents and being my enemies, because I, I think that the fate of American democracy requires their defeat, not compromise, compromising with them, but they must be defeated. Nevertheless, I think about people like us, people of the center left, of the left, of the center right, and I think, you know, the people who too quickly, as uh, Nadia just described, uh, uh, started seeing all political problems as being technical, not, not being political problems, but being technical problems that experts should, should address. And there was lots, lots of people were saying no, <laughs> but people like us weren't listening and weren't paying attention and weren't modifying our political positions, uh, keeping in mind not only their concerns, but also their insights, because they were actually, there was a knowledge that, uh, 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 that they had about the fate of the earth, about the, the, the situation of their lives that uh, we didn't have and weren't part of the, te the technocratic calculus and the political compromises between the center right and the center left. Uh, so, so I think it's very, very important to kind of to, to focus on that. Th then, you know, as self-critique, uh, uh, then I, I really want to um, 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 kind of uh, talk a little bit about, I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, it. I'd like to ask you a question. 
Uh, it seems that this populism is, at least as I'm observing it in the United States, is different from populisms hitherto. That, that, that uh, ideology is actually not very important. <laughs> It, 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 you know, unlike the, the populisms of the 20th century, um, uh, what Trump stands for, what he wants, what his people want, other than an affirmation of their identity and making sure that the people they don't like don't have power. Uh, uh, th 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 there's, uh, you know, that's a very, very important part of it. It's, it's populism without ideology, uh, I think is part of our condition. And uh, I think that's somehow related to the, uh, the fate of truth. Mm -hmm. Th that, um, you know, the great obscenity of the 20th century, uh, uh, highlighted you. by political thinkers such as Hannah Arendt, but also imaginative political uh, humanist such as uh, George Orwell is is that uh, uh, truth and power were conflated. I mean, this is you know in my in my my studies of uh, previously existing socialist Bach and socialism, it, that was the key. That 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 what you know Trotsky once said to his shame that uh, the only truth I know is the truth of the party. So, so, so that the, the, the uh, idea that truth was infinitely malleable uh, as exercised by the power, the powers, but that it still was treated as truth. And now we live in a world uh, where uh, the pretense of truth ha has, has been uh, 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 abandoned. So, so you just say whatever you want to say and call it true and uh, count, counterfactuals uh, are uh, completely uh, uh, irrelevant. And, um, and then you build a politics on that. So I, I think that the crisis of our time, I mean, it's the reason why I don't want to say, uh, you know, we, we define ideology differently, but, you know, I, I still think political ideas and imaginations are central now. And, and one of the crises of our times is that uh, for a significant part of the population, the only idea is me, the people, you know, yeah. it, it, you know, uh, yes, this, this is very important because, uh, you know, particular democracy, democracy makes some important promises and these promises are not uh, through some false kind of promises. It promises that the, the, the society we live in uh, needs to and must treat us, all of us, as uh, with dignity as human beings, individually speaking, and to give us equal chance for a voice and for the participation. It makes many other important, several other important promises concerning a decent life and so on and so forth. You cannot, if you are a Democrat, promise people to be poor and destitute or not to care about them. Makes no sense. So, so these promises are based on, on important beliefs and principles. And, and sometimes we assume them not only as given, but as something uh, uh, that are difficult to ponder difficult to translate into data and for this reason not uh, so important for politics but they are because because those the populists so-called they perhaps don't have to choose the truth and they don't use the ideology either but they are capable of uh, putting together together a politics of emotion mm -hmm. they are very good in mobilizing emotions even if on terrible things like me against you or like uh, uh, the Afro-American coming to, to Europe are the, the, the reason for our decline and so on and so forth. So how can we think of a democracy capable of responding to these emotion-based politics without renouncing uh, the question of okay, that democracy is a form of politics, it's not something else. So, so, so I, 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 you know, I have an immediate response and then a reflective response. So, so my immediate response is that we human beings are complicated. 
And, uh, uh, and it is the case that rational argument and emotions uh, interact with each other. We're all emotional beings. I mean, anyone who's paying attention to, uh, as you and I are now talking, realize that we're passionate about what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, that's emotions. And politics includes that. Uh, uh, so, you know, the idea that we have to somehow uh, uh, exile emotions and, and they get on with rational politics is a huge mistake. Yeah. Uh, 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 but then the question is, uh, is there a way of capturing uh, uh, emotions uh, more successfully? Well, there, there is. P political actors and political leaders can do that. I'm just going to point to Joe Bi Biden and say, this is a man who actually uses emotions. Uh, uh, he's emotionally intelligent and he's using emotions as he is learning to be a progressive and actually, uh, 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 you know, not perfectly, but addressing the problems of our times. Okay, that, that, that's for politicians, leaders. But then I, I'm going back to how you describe populism. And if I remember correctly, you're in Rimini now, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so uh, it's you remind. I'm thinking now of another uh, uh, citizen of Rimini, Alberto Malucci. Ah, okay. uh, and 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 and, uh, uh, and the, the subject of his obsessions, and that is social movements. So, so it seems to me that this work that populists are doing, social, Alberto highlighted, social movements do as well. And that they and best to think of them as a significant part of political life that's outside the formal political system, but absolutely yes. key to democratic life. Yes, yes, this is crucial because this has to do with the two legs of democracy, not only institutions, but the preparation for what the institutions are supposed to deal with. That is. The development of, of, of our uh, opinions, ideas, proposals, uh, and contestations. This is part of democracy. It's not something that is a disturbance. What, in my view, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why populism is so successful today, because it's capable to putting together the outside of, a, of and the inside to fill the gap, so-called, as I said before, the gap. With the, because the, the parties are no longer there, many as political associations of participatory kind are no longer there, to fill that gap that is empty now. And so they are good in mobilizing movements. The central left, at least in Europe, they are doing what? They are talking to uh, people perhaps in the institutions, but they are no longer capable of interacting with society. This so, is so, so so I, I, I often take a front when people describe me as an optimist because, <laughs> because I, I'm not. I mean, I, th I think that there are many, many problems and, I, and my, uh, I, I, I wouldn't bet on the future of democracy in America. Uh, but I'm looking for, people then think I'm an optimist because I look for what are the possible bases of hope? And uh, I, I, I uh, recently read and had a discussion with the author of a book, uh, Diva Woodley, entitled Reckoning, which is on uh, the, the uh, uh, movement for Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, in, in the United States. And uh, she makes the general, she makes a general argument that uh, we, theor she's a theorist of democracy. So we theorists of democracy actually have to consider social movements as being an integral part of democratic life in, you know, given the contemporary configuration of our politics. And then she highlights how Black Lives Matter has actually done this work. So, so you, you're pessimistic about what's going on in Europe. I'm relatively hopeful about the role of social movements in the United States. I think that, uh, you know, I celebrate uh, uh, what Joe Biden has done in his first hundred days, but he never would have done it if it weren't for Black Lives Matter. He never would, would have done it if it weren't for Occupy Wall Street. That, that these movements have been a key 
to formulating an alternative to Trumpism. Now, will it be decisive? I don't know. You know, you know, we it, it's at you know the Democrats uh, uh, have to prevail. Uh, the the attempts by Republicans to uh, the uh, you no know, to weaken the social movements to marginalize them to to uh, um, kind of limit uh, access to the vote uh, are very very severe threats. May I say something that is connected to populism on this issue because I think it's crucial now. Stacey Abram in, in Georgia, she mm -hmm. did something extraordinary in my yes. view. Yes. She proved that it's possible to use political association, party, in order to connect society and the movements and the states. Right. She did so outside of so-called establishment kind of parties, and she showed us, all of us, what democracy is about. First, cannot exist without parties. Otherwise you have a green law connecting people to the web, but without any kind of control of those who are then elected. It's a new oligarchy. Or you have a populistic uh, representation as embodiment without. So we need pluralism, political pluralism organized through parties. Now, the question is that today parties are simply machinery for elections, fine, but she showed and she won yes. 11 or more years. She won on this issue. And this should be, in my view, is a very, very important message, meaning co constructing again the connections between political parties and participation of the people. Yeah, so, so, so she has been nominated for the Nobel Prize for Peace. And, and I, 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 I absolutely uh, support uh, the nomination. I that think is it, incredible. Uh, yeah. She's intelligent. She's no, a political Very, intelligent. very intelligent. Very, very intelligent. I, but I think it's also the it, it, Occupy Wall Street uh, kind of faded. But I think the one reason why Black Lives Matter is not fading is actually it learned from uh, maybe the failure of Occupy Wall Street, but uh, uh, more likely the long history of the civil rights movement, and, and then um, uh, and the victory of uh, politicians such as uh, Stacey Abrams. They they have, with some controversy, uh, uh, made a party turn. So they they understand that a, a part of the social movement is yeah. collaborating uh, uh, with. Uh, Alas, it has to be the Democratic Party Definitely. in the United States. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, similar developments in uh, in uh, Europe, East and West, uh, would have alternative parties to connect with. But but it's absolutely you know when I think about what's going on in Poland, it's absolutely central that the the uh, alternative parties to uh, peace. Uh, 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 strengthen themselves, collaborate with each other, and link with social movements. Okay. I don't know. <clears throat> so uh, I had a, a viewer question uh, quite connected to that, and I think in part you answered. Um, the question is, what is the future of ideology? Will ideology evaporate? And should children be taught ideologies at school, primary or secondary schools? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think... Uh, you know, again, I'm a student of Hannah Arendt. So I think that uh, um, uh, education and politics need to be kept apart. Uh, uh, it's, a da it's extraordinarily dangerous when politicians think that they have to educate adults. That's, that's another uh, uh, formulation of tyranny. Uh, and it's extraordinarily dangerous when uh, uh, teachers teach political truths to children. But what they need to do is take responsibility for the world as it is, to inform students, not, not to give ideological training, but to inform students about the history of ideas, the history of political ideas, the history of political ideologies. Uh, the, 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 the questions that this poses but they shouldn't uh, present answers. Now, uh, uh, I, I think, 
you know, my negative view of ideologies, I'll put aside for a moment. And I'll say that if we want to use ideology as, you know, political ideas, systematic, uh, alter committed to alternative fundamental principles, uh, those are absolutely necessary. Uh, 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 in schools, we should teach students about the ones that are current and decent. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in politics, we have to base our activity upon such ideas, alternative ideas. I, I agree on this. I don't have a particular things to add to that. The, what we want to, since democracy has enemies inside and outside, to make a citizens understand that it's not simply a promenade or something bureaucratic that they can have uh, or not, uh, dependent, independent of their will, this needs to be changed a little bit because we are too, too much bureaucratic in considering democracy. So it's enough to be democratic citizens to be, to be free and to do what you like and to uh, be indifferent to the public or to not to have a, a sense of, uh, I wouldn't say duty, but a sense of uh, uh, that, that you have some, uh, yes, some moral duties to all the Respons community. Responsibility. Yeah, responsibility. responsibility. So in this sense, uh, civic education, which is not ideology, right. is crucial. I mean, this is what John Dewey and, and used to do. Uh, well, no, I agree. I agree. I, civic education, but not uh, political education. Oh, yes. No, no, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, sometimes they seem to be close. Yeah, uh, and, and, and actually discerning the difference between the two is not easy. <laughs> uh, For instance, uh, one uh, of the important value is pluralism. Yeah. It's uh, tolerance toward others, acceptance. Doesn't mean that they have to agree with but uh, the, uh, to understand to understand that we live in a plural world, not only not only because uh, of uh, you know physical reality, but also mentality and opinions. This is essential in my view in a democracy. Otherwise, we end up creating enemies and and uh, um, and, and hatred, uh, which is terrible. Yeah, of course. Of course, this is where the, there is great where it, the present situation yeah. presents extraordinary challenges because what I said applies to kind of normal political situation uh, uh, but when in fact uh, uh, the existence of the polity is uh, in question or the existence of democracy itself is in question is being challenged which um, um, is not only the situation of the new democracies but also of the well-established democracies, then actually making these distinctions um, um, is very, very difficult. But they, but we have to pursue them. You know, we have to make. You know, I can't teach uh, my students to be social democrats. You know. Th th yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, uh, but I have to uh, um, uh, teach the values of the republic. <laughs> You know, the fundamental values of the Republic. I just want to let everybody know that we are, are nearing the end, like have like 10 minutes. So if anyone wants to ask another question, please do it in the uh, chat section. Um, I wanted, uh, in the meantime, I wanted to come back um, to uh, the question that was raised uh, by both of you. Uh, the difference between the technocratic politics and one one of the forms that prevail in democrat in democracies and the populist politics of me the people. Um, what uh, do you think the current or ongoing crisis of uh, COVID epidemic uh, reveals about this political divide between the professional politics executed by? experts versus uh, politics, me, the people. Who is going to? Well, I, can, I, I, I think that at least in Europe, in my view, much more than in the States, the myth of a technocratic solution to problems is so big, huge. Uh, and some scholars have coined recently, not so recently, but in the last few years, the expression technopopulism. Mm -hmm. Meaning, 
in my country, this government, Draghi's government or Macron government, the idea that you have a above ideologies and above right and left uh, leaders who is not leader, who is not a political leader, but he knows what to do. So he's a technical one and keeps together uh, practically all right and left without a contraposition. Such a kind of, you have the unity of the people, instead of putting a me uh, as a demagogue, you put a me as solving problems through technical ways and you, we, we don't discuss. Okay. Now, now as an example very close, there is a discussion about the recovery plan, huge amount of money, 220 billion, I don't know, euro. Before this government, there was a quarrel and this discussion everywhere and every now everybody's silent they are waiting for the response of this government it will come these days in the in the parliament one day of discussion and then it will be sent to brussels so there was practically no deliberation simply a system of decision making by a, a college a, 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 some experts uh, 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 groups so that is a way also of having beyond right, right and left in a populistic sense, uh, bypassing the demagoguery, and so everybody's happy. Uh, uh, there's a uh, there is an on the other hand. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I think that um, substituting uh, technocracy for democracy, as you describe, is a very serious problem, and I think it's actually a key to understanding. The um, uh, the failures of the uh, of 1989. Yes, for yes. example. Uh, but the refusal to recognize that some issues are not political. Uh, uh, you know, some some questions have technical solutions. Oh yeah. So, yeah. You know, so so uh, how to uh, um, kind of approach the pharmaceutical industry. Um, uh, in distributing the vaccines and how to control it, that's, that, that's a political issue. Uh, the solution to the pandemic does require that the population oh, yeah. take the vaccine. Absolutely. A and that people turn a public health mandate into a political problem is, um, is potentially disastrous. Uh, and, and um, you know, I, I, I thought until a few days ago that uh, as the, the worth of the vaccine would become clear to the population in the United States, that the he hesitancy would disappear. And indeed, that has been the case in the initial greater hesitancy in the African-American and the Latino communities. But it's not amongst Trumpists, white Trumpists. They are seeing the vaccine, as they saw earlier, the masks, as being uh, 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 an agent, uh, you know, uh, uh, a political problem, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an attack on their freedoms. And I think this is a case where a technical problem, technical solution addresses the need of the common good, and we have to recognize that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is not an issue. The issue is when uh, the allocation of money, whether in the in one sector or another one, right. this can be solved by uh, leaders of a bank or leaders of a. Uh, of corporation for the entire political community. This is something that we see today. Paradoxically, we see uh, the positivist myth of the 19th century back, but this time as an answer to populism, uh, yeah. which is a form of techno-populism, as somebody, somebody has written. Uh, but you're yeah. right on the other issues. So, so, so then how do we think, I don't know if there's another question, so how, how do we think of the alternative to that? You know, uh, uh, and, and you know, I, I'll, I'll start, by um, kind of pointing to one thing that I, you know, I, I'll ask you the question, but for me, a part of the answer has to do with social movements. Well, you know, 
a question to be asked would be the following. We know a lot about uh, how we entered populism, economic crisis, blah, blah. We have many crises and many issues. The question to be asked now would be how we exit. Now, until now, the US and the United the Europe, they show, in my view, two ways. Well, of course, we cannot be so schematic, but just in order to talk, right. uh, to understand us. One, the Biden Democrats American case, it's embracing the political struggle for one position against another one. This is not populism. This is democracy alternation that has to do with one party instead of another one with a majority different, taking the risk of talking to the people and presenting proposals to the people in the name of values that a part of the population recognizes as their own part, not of everybody necessarily. And this is an important element of political revitalization of democracy. The other solution is the European solution, more on the tone of the Brussels, which became in the last 40 years, we are talking about 89, but we, we forget 89 meant also the right. beginning of the shaping of Maastricht, uh, right. so which implies the technocratic solution to problems in order to avoid conflicts, in order to make a political conflict no longer part of the screen outside of it. And this is, in my view, the, mm, the, the, the timidity of Europeans who were so much used of conflict. They were so much used about different parties. Now they don't want to have anything to do. They prefer to have a solution that is outside and beyond right and left, in one way, populist or another, technocracy. So I think the Americans today, in my view, the American way out of populism is the most uh, inspiring one because it uh, takes into account the possibility of social movement, political organization participation in the making of their projects without, uh, without disclaiming that are a part of and trying to take the other parts on their side. Yeah. So this is what democracy was all, all and until uh, uh, since the Athenian side, it was always side for or against, always. Participazione, yeah. participare, it means both to take part in a process and to take a side. It means right. two things. So taking side is important in a democracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I, 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 um, you know, I, as uh, I've told the two of you, uh, uh, my daughter lives in Paris. So you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I care about, uh, I, I have my, uh, personal stake in the future of Europe. Uh, I also have many, many friends, uh, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and particularly in Poland. And uh, I love the, the idea of Europe. Uh, uh, and and um, uh, it saddens me tremendously uh, that this technocracy, that Europe has become identified with this um, kind of um, um, anti-political character uh, because it's not democratic. Uh, and, um, and this is one of the instances where Democracy is not only an ideal that we um, that we embrace, but it's also functional. <laughs> Th yeah. That without without it, Europe can't work, and uh, and we're kind of seeing that now. Uh, you know, my my friends, uh, uh, you know, in the 1980s, you know, to be European was uh, was an absolute ideal, uh, but uh, my younger friends who are post-1989 uh, kind of political actors, uh, Europe has come to mean something very different. And um, uh, I still think something that has to be embraced, but it's flawed and it has to be criticized. Now, um, I'm not a, a, a chauvinist enough to say that America shows the way. 
Uh, I've never right. thought about America, you know, because you know we are facing very severe problems, but we seem to be muddling through in a wise direction that um, should be carefully understood and examined right now. So not a model, but but a, a, a set of experiences and practices, practices and experiences mm -hmm. that that uh, at least for the moment. Um, uh, looks to be uh, exemplary. Um, obviously, if we had this discussion a year ago, uh, we, we wouldn't be saying this. <laughs> right, this is the beauty of democracy that you can change yeah. your position right. without uh, uh, exiting the state. Yeah, uh, you know, when, when I, uh, uh, after the changes, I, I started going to um, uh, Eastern Europe regularly and, uh, um, and, you know, always oppose the idea of transition, not, not transformation and change, but transition as if there was a clear teleology to it. Uh, uh, and I always uh, hesitated talking about models, uh, rather it's experiences, yeah. practices. Uh, uh, it, and, and this kind of um, packaging into a model, into an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, my suspicion of that, I learned from my friends in the democratic opposition in Central Europe. And when I talk about, when I personally talk about the lost treasure of the revolutionary tradition as it's manifested in that part of the world, this is what's, th this insight is what I fear has been lost. And uh, uh, and has to be uh, uh, re recovered. Yeah, I think it's a very good suggestion for the conclusion of this uh, dialogue. Um, so I want to thank you both for your time and for your contribution and for for your thoughts. I also want to thank the Europe for Citizens program uh, that made it possible, as well as partners, Democracy Seminar, the New School for Social Research, Institute for International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University, and my separate thanks to Maxima Smilta from European Humanities University for helping uh, with the initial planning of this event. If you, any of the viewers would be interested in the results of the project we had doing these talks uh, um, in, uh, you can visit New Eastern Europe uh, page at neweasterneurope.eu, uh, Visegrad Insight and visegradinsight.eu forward slash rethink1989. So this event is um, the first in the three day um, uh, events conference. I urge everybody on the website to, to visit uh, uh, this website you are watching this um, talk on and um, join other events tomorrow and on Wednesday, focus on transition history and democratic future, including on the role of civil society and media, a special round table for young people, the legacy of transition and the future of democracy, as well as on teaching of transition. I thank you both once again. I thank all the viewers that connected and have a lovely evening or day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Is there any way?